is Wade Owens, and I am so incredibly excited to be here. I come from Nashville, and I know your pastor, love your pastor, love his family. Listen, he is the real deal. He passes the close-up test every time we talk. He talks about how much he loves you and loves what the Lord is doing here and feels like the Lord has just planted him right in the middle of the most amazing group of people ready to saturate Spartanburg and South Carolina and the nations with the gospel. So, man, I love this man and his family. Would you give it up for your pastor? Yeah, love you, brother. Tell you a little bit about me. I've got a picture of my family. This is my family here. That's my wife, Kim, my son, Caleb, daughter, Madeline, and Kennedy. We've been married, believe it or not, going on 26 years. And when I met my wife, thank you, I appreciate that. Like, it's, marriage is hard. And I met her when I was 19, wasn't a Christian, in college, waiting tables on the weekends. She had moved from New Mexico to Houston, hated Houston, wanted to get back, so she was waiting tables. Our first day was together, and man, I knew, I was like, she's awesome. But she wouldn't have anything to do with me. She's moving back, and so what's a guy to do? You just turn up the smolder, keep trying more and more, and she just, that nothing worked. Like, what are you doing Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday? Finally, like, listen, what are you doing Sunday? She's like, well, I'm going to church. Do you want to go to church? I was like, yeah. She's like, are you a Christian? I said, is that good? She said, yeah. I was like, sure, absolutely. <laughs> I'll go anywhere you want to go. So I went to church, and I walked into a place like this that proclaims the gospel. And I heard about Jesus for the first time in my life. And my heart just melted inside of me. Four weeks later, the first person that I led to the Lord was myself. I said, God, if, you, if you're real and, and Jesus is who he says he is and, and you change lives, would you change mine? And he did and married her and we've got three amazing kids. And, and my youngest one, Kennedy here, man, she's, she's awesome. She's a little fireball. She's great and I can talk about her since she's not here. But growing up in Houston, don't tell her, okay? And so growing up in Houston, like, if you've never been, it's a massive metroplex, eight, nine million people, eight-lane highways. It's, it's so hot and so sticky and so much traffic. I think on Friday nights, the Holy Spirit's like, I'm out. Just, you're on your own. It's just, it's crazy. And so we were going across town, and it was just bumper to bumper. But I, I knew the back roads. I lived there for 40 years. I knew how to get around. I knew what I was doing. And I'm driving, turning and driving and turning. And my little daughter, she's probably three or four in the back seat at this moment. She looks at me and she's like, Dad, do you know where you're going? Yeah, baby, I know where I'm going. And I'm weaving and I'm turning. She's like, Dad, do you know where you're going? Baby, I know where I'm going. Dad, yeah, baby, I think you're lost. <laughs> Well, I think you're about to get a spanking. How about that? So, <laughs> There's been so many times in my life where I'm like, God, do you know where you're going? Do you know what you're doing? See, in that moment, what my daughter saw felt greater than anything I said. Like what she saw overshadowed what I said. And there's so many times in life, we as followers of Jesus, as Christians, like what we see feels greater than what God said. And in those moments, I have to remind myself, man, I'm, I'm like a little kid in the back seat. Like, Dad, do you know where you're going? It's nothing new. It's, it's in fact been the history of God's people. You're going to see this exact same thing in Numbers chapter 13. Open your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to pray and we'll dig in. Dear Lord, God of heaven, would you keep these people and this church and your pastor and their team from, from ever fearing what they see and it causing them to believe that what they see is greater than what you said. God, I pray for faith and courage in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Okay, so in Numbers 13, God's people are in the wilderness. You know this. You've been studying Exodus. So they're headed to the promised land, and this 11 or 12-day journey, as you know, ends up taking 40 years. But 
at this moment in Numbers 13, it's only been a little over a year since they left Egypt. And God's people right now, they're encamped right on the southern border of the promised land. They're, they're right there. And we're going to pick up in verse 27, but let me kind of summarize the first part of this chapter. God wants to give his people a, a glimpse of the promised land. He, he wants them to see how good it is and see what he's promised. So he tells Moses, select one person from each of the 12 tribes, 12 men recognized as leaders, go check out the land, get a report and bring back, tell us how good the land is. They weren't going to look at the real estate market, they weren't going to check out the schools, they weren't caring about what the interest rates were, just go see the land, and they did, and they spent 40 days checking it out. And on the way back, I want to point out two places where they stopped. Number one, if you look in verse 22, they stopped in Hebron, which is a very significant place. That, that's where the bones of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were buried. Imagine that. They're, they're standing on a place of promise, like a down payment right there. And so they pause there. And while they're there, they see the descendants of Anak. Some scary people, the descendants of Anak. And these, these descendants are not innocuous, okay? That was a joke. Like, you missed it. Like, I worked all week on that one line, and you failed. But the descendants of Anak, like, they were legit giants. They, Goliath-like, abnormally tall, eight-foot-tall, massive people. And they see these intimidating people, and on the way back, they also stop in the valley of Eshkol, and while they're there, they see these grapes. And I've got a picture here of uh, an olive wood statue in Israel depicting the cluster of grapes. It's called an Eshkol that they brought back. Those are big grapes. Like You don't get those at Costco. Those are, those are coconut-sized grapes, legit huge grapes, so big they would have hung it on a pole, one in front and one in back, and, and they're bringing it back as evidence of the fertility and goodness of the land. And so they arrive back in camp, and Moses wants a report. Okay, you scouted the land. You've been gone 40 days. Tell me about the cities. Tell me about the people. Tell me about the land. And that's, that's where we pick up the story. Look at your Bible, verse 27. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, say it out loud with me, church, it's flowing with, what is it? Yeah, yeah milk and honey. Have you ever heard that? Well, that, that's a Middle Eastern expression of a fruitfulness and abundance. These were both commodities. And here is some of its what? Fruit. Well, what was the fruit? Yeah, the grapes, the eshkol. So they're like, Moses, man, this land is a really good land. Look at what God has provided, it's really something. God's so good. And you would expect, if you keep reading, that they're going to be celebrating. It's a praise party about to break out. But it all comes to a crashing halt with, with just one word. One word. L look at verse 28. What's the word? <laughs> milk and honey and fruit. However, are we not some however type of people? Come on, don't be so holy. Are we not some however type of people? You do know that the nation of Israel is just a mirror for us. Like in that moment, they knew what the Lord had done, rescued them from Egypt, parted the Red Sea, manna from heaven, law from Mount Sinai, pillar of fire, pillar of cloud. However, however, look, verse 28, the people living in the land are strong and the cities are large and fortified. And we also saw the descendants of Anak there. Like we know what God has said and we know what he's promised, but let me tell you, let me tell you what we saw. There's giants, there's walls, fortified cities. And so listen, what they saw was greater than what God said. What they saw overshadowed what God had said. And 
Quite often people would say, hey, seeing, that's believing. But in this case, seeing was actually disbelieving because what they saw was greater than what God said. I know what God said, but let me tell you what I saw. Listen, our senses can often seem stronger than what God said. They're like, I know he said he's going to provide us. I know he said he's going to protect us. But wait, 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 wait. Let me tell you what we saw. And what they saw overshadowed everything that God had been saying. And then in verse 29, they continued to report. And basically what they say is, listen, there are enemies everywhere. And they list these people groups who are there. And they're like, they're, they're going to war against us. And they're basically going to make it impossible for us to enter. And they're giving this report in word by word, by word, by word. What God said was being extinguished by what they saw. Walls, giants, enemies, I know what God said, but listen to what I saw. So you have to know like what you see and what you face can very easily make you forget what God said. But, but your eyes, your, your feelings, your emotions, your senses, those are not the ultimate authority. What you see is not the ultimate source of truth. Church, what God said is the ultimate source of truth. And we're not so different from the people of Israel, are we? Like our, our eyes betray us all the time. Click on the news. Oh, man, I don't like that economic report. Change the channel. I don't like that news cycle. You pay attention to cultural shifts. You're like, man, there are some massive unhealthy shifts in our culture right now. Read another article, and technology is changing rapidly, and AI is going to take over the world. And before you know it, like the sky is just falling. Don't you know what I see? Don't you know what I saw? Yeah, I do. But let me tell you what God said. Like sometimes, don't miss this, seeing can actually be the number one source of your disbelief. And so we need eyes, but we need eyes of faith. Eyes that are locked into God's word. Eyes that are following the shepherds and pastors in front of us. And God knew these people groups lived there. Like, go back and look at Genesis 15 when he, when he ratified his covenant with Abraham. He listed every name that they just listed as a potential enemy. And he said, it doesn't matter. I'm giving you the land. I'm going to poof, take them out, and I'm going to poof, put you there. God already knew that. But now, well... Now we've got a majority report on our hand. There's all these people in the land. It's never going to happen. And, and maybe you missed this because I summarized the first 26 verses pretty quickly. But, but look back up at verse 2 at what God told them before they even scouted the land. Look back at verse 2. God said, send men to scout out the land of Canaan. I am what? Giving. Before they left, go look. It's yours. Go build your faith. God was not concerned or uncertain. He's given it to them. Here's my word. Go look at what I have in store. But, oh, you don't know what I saw. Our faith, your faith, it can't rise and fall based on what you see or feel. Because truth has never and will never be based on what we see or feel. Truth has always been based on what God said. And God has never once failed his people. Yeah, but Wade, you don't, you don't know what I see. I know what he said. And the majority report was, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. But listen. <laughs> Praise God for a minority report that's about to come out. There were 12 and 10 said no way, but a minority report of two said, I know what God said and I want to challenge this church to be full of minority report type of people. 
I want you to support your pastor, follow the Lord, lean in, be a minority report type of people. I don't care what we saw. I, don't, I know what God said. We're going. We're marching forward in faith. The world needs a group of people courageous and eager to follow the Lord no matter what it takes. Be a minority report type of people. Look at verse 30. Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, let's go up when? Why? God said it. I take possession of the land because we can. Why can they? God is with us. We're going. I love that. But back to the majority report, 31. But the men who had gone up with them responded, we, we can't attack the people because they're stronger than we are. Oh, quick question, yes or no? Are they, are they right? Okay, this is where you respond. I have to repeat myself. Service is going to go long. Yes or no? Are they right? No, no, listen, they are correct. Yes, the men that they're about to fight are way stronger and more prepared for them. But, but when did Israel ever start fighting her own battles? God always fought on her behalf. God always fights for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? So they were both right and wrong. And so listen, the majority may rule. But the majority is most often wrong. And fear literally became contagious in this moment and spread like wildfire. And did you know today what the number one marketing tool is? Do you know what it is? Fear. It shifted throughout the generations if you follow it. Open any device, turn on anything. And it's fear. Look at this, see this. Look at this, see that it's fear. You gotta see it for what it is. And I have seen throughout my 25 years of pastoring, I've seen fears take over people, take over churches. And, and I have seen great churches make great mistakes. And listen, make no mistake, this is a great church. Mike, you told me 187 years of gospel ministry right here, come on. Any of you here for the entire 187 years? Just No? Okay. But listen, great churches can make great mistakes because fear begins to creep in. And quite often, one of the fears is that like, we want to stay in the safety of where we've been. And they become too afraid to go where God wants to take them, where God is leading the leaders to take them. And they're like, but, but we could lose all of this. Now, what, what about what you might gain? Israel wanted to be back in Egypt. That's where their past was. That was safety. But God was taking them to the promised land. Great churches, churches like this, never stop trusting what God said. They never stop trusting his leaders and where they're taking them. They're always eager to step into God's preferred future, praying for God's best, digging into the word, praying for their pastor, following him. Great church, be a great church, continue that. But we still got majority report, verse 32, look. So <laughs> they gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land they had scouted. The land we pass through to explore is one that devours. No, it doesn't. It's a good land, a land of milk and honey. When you lead with your eyes and your emotions, you start exaggerating everything. The land wasn't going to devour them. It was going to bless them. Look at the end of verse 32. Devours its inhabitants. And how many people? All the people. No, it wasn't all the people. It was a few in one place. When you lead with your eyes, you make giants out of everything. And what your senses reveal to you is not always true because we have limited vision. We don't see clearly. The Bible says we're pilgrims and sojourners. We don't have God's vantage point. And so they discouraged the people from ever going. The majority carried the day, except for two, Joshua and Caleb. The majority carried the day, and they didn't go. It shook their confidence. And if you look at chapter 14, God says, listen, the bones of all of those who didn't walk in faith are going to be scattered in the wilderness, and a new generation will go in. If you haven't read chapter 14, go read it. That'll bless you. Verse 33, Luke. 
We even saw the Nephilim. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers, and we must have seemed the same to them. Ten saw themselves as grasshoppers. Two stood on what God said. Ten based their future on what they saw. Two stood on what God said. Can I show you a picture? Doesn't matter. I'm going to do it, so just watch. Do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? Ministry of Tourism. This right now is the current logo of the Ministry of Tourism right now in Israel. Do you know where that came from? Numbers 13 right here when the, when the spies brought the Eshkol, the cluster of grapes back. Do you see it? So everyone living in the land right now sees this. Everyone going to visit, coming and going sees this. And they're like, yeah, God did what he said. But you know what? Like everyone today has the privilege of being on this side of history. Like it's written. They know that it's true. I don't want to be the type of person or pastor that has to wait for history to be written in a moment of uncertainty to stand on what God has already said. And in that moment, the majority carried the day. Walls, giants, enemies, Canaanites, Tannerites, parasites, I don't know, all the ites, there were a lot of them. The majority report won, but you know, if you keep reading, in God's power, according to his promise, 39 years later, they went into that land. Giants fell and walls went down. And it wasn't their military prowess. They blew trumpets. And walls literally crumbled. And if you go look at the archaeological sites, the walls actually fell outward and built ramps for them to climb in. Because when you're in the hands of the Lord Most High, don't let what you see overshadow what he said. God said, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. But wait, you don't, you don't know what's happening in my life right now. I, can't, I really have a hard time seeing God's hand. You, you read his word and he said, I'm with you. I see you. I know you. Man, I don't even know if I'm ever even going to make it to heaven. God said, I am right now preparing a place for you. Some of you are walking through something really heavy. You're like, I don't know if I can make it through this trial. God said, my strength is sufficient. Like, I'm so weary, my wife and I. We had six miscarriages the first seven years of our life. And I remember being so tired and so weary and my faith feeling razor thin. You ever been there? And I woke up and I I turned to Romans 8. I said, what will ever separate me from the love of God? Nor angels, nor demons, nor death nor anything that's ever been created will ever separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So I'm thin, but he's not. Man, things are bad. He will work all things together for good. Didn't say they are good. Said he will. I might lose my job. I might lose my health. God said, you don't lose me. My faith is weak. Do you ever feel like you're like one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, and four steps back? You ever feel that way? Again, is this not a place of honesty? Yeah, I feel that. God said, I began a work in you. I'll bring it to completion. So as we get ready for 120 seconds of reflection, here's what I want to ask you. 
What are you seeing right now? What majority report are you locked in on? What's carrying the day for you? Like, if it's not the day maker, then change the channel. Be the type of people, church, one another, that will flip the script, that will go, hey, from what I see is greater than what God said, you become the type of person that says, no, 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 listen, what God said will always be greater than what I see. So here's, here's the question. What are you seeing? Who are you trusting? I want you to take, take a moment and make the space around you a, a, holy, a holy space. And maybe today is the day you flip the script from what I see is greater than what God said to no, 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 what God said is greater than what I see. What's the majority report you're listening to? Take the next 120 seconds and just talk to him, spend time with him, meditate on his word. Lord, would you move amongst your people? Would your spirit have freedom? God, would you create courage and faith? Would this church rise up and never deviate from your word? Be full of faith. Pray for, follow their pastor. Saturate this area with the gospel. I pray for Joshua's and Caleb's and a minority report to echo throughout this land. In Jesus' name, amen. Reason to wait, my heart needs to say.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us. You know, I don't know what God was speaking to you, but I have a feeling that he's calling you to trust him in greater measure than you are right now. You know, it's funny, sometimes we don't see the way God sees and the spies, when they went back 40 years later, they found out that the people were terrified of them. They were afraid of what God was going to do. And that may be the same for you. So I don't know what next step that looks like for you. Maybe it's trusting Jesus. Maybe it's joining this church. Maybe it's having a courageous stand in your workplace or at school. But I do know that God's going to be with you as you go into it. So have courage. We're with you. We're for you. And we know that God wants to do something powerful in you and through you. Today, if uh, you want to take that next step of joining our church, please come down afterwards. There are faithful men and women who love to pray with you, invite you to take a next step. Uh, you can go through these doors to our guest services. You can find friends there that'll help you join a group or join the church. But today, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this thing. And thank you to Wade and Johnny as well. Would you guys thank them for being here with us? And we love you guys. It's, it's, it's a big part of doing ministry with friends that you love. And so thank you guys for being here and just blessing us today. Now today, let me just pray a blessing over you as you get ready to leave. Before I do that, by the way, I was going to say one last thing. Uh, I'm kicking off a new series next week. We're finishing the book of Exodus. We're calling it Meet With Me. And we're going to try to do 20 chapters in seven weeks. So we're going to be going fast. So buckle up. It's going to be awesome. And uh, I think that God's got a very powerful word for us over the next season as we do that. So let me just pray over us. Jesus, thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you for who they are. And as they go from this place, God, I pray that they walk in power, in calling, in an identity as your children. So God, whatever they're facing, God, I pray that they would hear your voice and walk with confidence because you said that you're going to be with them. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. We love you.